Our subject of the morning is when Paul prayed. For two years, we put a great emphasis here in this church on prayer from the pulpit. In fact, the first year of our Through the Bible program, if you will hearken back to it, you'll recall that we did not miss an opportunity of bringing a message on the subject of prayer. But this year, we have not done so. We attempted to put another emphasis, but I'm almost inclined to return to the emphasis of prayer. Never in my ministry have I felt the need of prayer as I do today. Never have I felt so inadequate to meet the situation of the present hour and the opportunities that come. feel so often that we are not able in and of ourselves, and we know that in and of ourselves that we are not. I'm confident that one of the reasons that God has blessed our radio ministry is because of the prayers of God's people. That is something that interests me a great deal, as I mentioned a moment ago, that so many people said, we listen to your program, but we have not written. But they all said, we pray for you. And I'm confident that up and down this coast today, that there are literally thousands of people that remember us in prayer. And that, to me, is the greatest encouragement that I have today in the ministry. And I do want to say in my introduction that I covet your prayers. I trust that when you find your way to the throne of grace that you will remember this poor preacher in prayer because he covets your prayers and he needs your prayers today. Now, the Apostle Paul was a great man of prayer, but he's not so considered. It's been interesting to note that in the history of the church, we think of him as being a great apostle. And many of us consider him the greatest apostle. Now, he considered himself the least of all the apostles. And in view of the fact that that's part of the inspired Word of God, I believe we have to accept it, that he is the least of all the apostles. But in my book, which is not inspired, he is the greatest of the apostles. I also consider him the greatest of the missionaries. No missionary can touch this man, this great, intrepid pioneer of the faith who went out into the Roman Empire, down Roman roads, surmounting hardships and obstacles that would have stopped an ordinary man, and he kept going on and on and on in order that he might bear the gospel of Christ to the very ends of that empire. And I think that he did. He could say that when he wrote the Colossians that the gospel has gone throughout the world. And what he meant was the Roman world. And certainly he was the one that led in carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. We think of him as being a great preacher. He was not a very impressive man physically. Today, a man needs to be very impressive physically. And I have noted that sometimes these great, big, tall preachers with great, basso, profundo voices get by with murder. They never study. They have very little to say, but the interesting thing is they are impressive physically, and people note that. Now, Paul very candidly tells us that he was not impressive physically. This little man who apparently had eyes that were running down with pus all the time, certainly he was not an attractive man, and yet he's one of the greatest preachers in the church. And no one can touch him as a teacher. Our Lord alone was a greater teacher than Paul the Apostle, and certainly he comes second. And then this man had a past 
pastor's heart. I've been teaching the past two weeks the epistle to the Philippians, and it's been borne in upon my mind afresh and anew. The fact that Paul the apostle had a pastor's heart and how he loved those people in Philippi and how they loved him, and it's the most cordial relationship that existed. And then certainly Paul the Apostle stands at the head of the list as one of the martyrs of the church. Only Stephen precedes him. Only Stephen could stand above him, but certainly he is second. We do not think of him, though, as a man of prayer, and yet this is the field in which he excels, I believe, above all others. Now, when we go through the Word of God, we find other men that we think of as men of prayer. Moses, yonder on Mount Sinai, pleading for the children of Israel, is an example of prayer. And even David, at the time of his sin, he goes to God in confession, is a great man of prayer. And Elijah, on top of Mount Carmel, is an example of a man of prayer. And Daniel, in a pagan court, spent a great deal of his time in prayer. And then, of course, our Lord himself, yonder in the Garden of Gethsemane, stands before us as a man of prayer. Now, Paul's prayer life is something to note. I formerly had students, when we'd study the epistles, list all of the ones that Paul mentioned he prayed for. And I've had student after student come up and say, well, I didn't know the Apostle Paul prayed for so many people. And then I would have to answer, but did you know we only have a partial list of those that he prayed for? The Apostle Paul was a man of prayer, a great man of prayer. There was a great preacher in Dallas, Texas, years ago. He was not a great preacher, but he had a great church and a great ministry. And his ministry was a ministry largely of prayer. They said he had a roll of paper like an ad machine. And that was his prayer list. And he would unroll it. They said it went through the living room, into the dining room, on into the kitchen. And that this man would start down the list, and you could always tell, especially his officers could tell, because he'd call them up. He'd say, look, I'm praying for so-and-so. He hasn't accepted Christ yet. Would you go over and talk to him while I pray for him? And the officers would always say, well, we know that Dr. Anderson is praying because he's got us all working. May I say to you, he had a great ministry because he had a great prayer list. By the way, what kind of a prayer list do you have? How many people do you remember in prayer? Say once a week. Maybe you're living a busy life these days, but once a week do you take time out and go down a prayer list and remember a group of people in prayer. And if you do have that, again, may I say, slip my name on it if it is not already there. Now this morning, I want us to note the prayers of the Apostle Paul that are recorded in Ephesians. Two of them are recorded here, and they are outstanding. Great many people think, well, we ought to go back to our Lord's Prayer, so-called, which is in the Sermon on the Mount. I think that it's a good prayer. Naturally, it's a good prayer. It's the prayer our Lord taught his disciples. But you see, they were learners. They were just starting out in this matter of praying, and therefore he had to give them the first lesson. And the Lord's Prayer, so-called, is in the first grade. I hope you are out of the first grade, and that you are a little farther along. And if you are a little farther along, then Paul the Apostle is your example of prayer. He's the man that I think is given to the believer today the great example for prayer. And this morning, I want us to notice several things about the prayers and the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. 
I'd like to look first of all at the characteristics of these two prayers. Then I'd like to look at the content of these two prayers. Under the characteristics, I'd like to note those things that are outward. And in the content, I'd like to note those things that are the inward part of the prayer. Now, first of all, let's note the characteristics. And there are several things here that are definitely very impressive. First of all, we find the motive for his prayer. What was it that would cause Paul the Apostle to go to prayer? Will you notice chapter 1, verse 15? Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now, do you notice what it was that sent him to prayer? It was good news, not bad news. Unfortunately today, we have to have a crisis. If today, for instance, somebody gets sick, why, we say, well, let's remember them in prayer. For some strange reason, we never pray for well people. We always pray for the sick. Then there's another thing that will cause us to pray. If there's a crisis on the mission field, if there's a crisis at home, if trouble has come, a sorrow, we remember folk in prayer in times of an emergency, in times of great necessity. Now, don't misunderstand me. Shouldn't we pray at those times? By all means. But the question is, is that the only time that we should pray for them? Shouldn't we have another motive? Shouldn't good news? Now, Paul says here, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Paul says, when I heard about your faith, faith to God, faith to Christ, and then I heard of your love to the brethren, that moved me to prayer. I wanted to pray for you. It was good news that prompted him to pray. Story is told that years ago a ship at sea was going down and the captain sent out over the loudspeaker the word to prayers, to prayers, to prayers. And one of these dowagers, she came up to him and says, Captain, has it come to this? In other words, as it's so desperate now that we are going to have to use prayer as a sort of a life preserver. We haven't been praying on the days there was no storm. But now that the storm is struck, the ship is going down, at last we're going to have to start praying. Isn't that the thing that causes many of us to pray today? It's the crisis. Rather than the time of rejoicing, it's bad news rather than good news that prompts us to prayer. Now, Paul's motive was good news. Now, the second thing is, his prayers were intercessory. If you notice that, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. And then you'll find that when you turn over to the prayer in the third chapter, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now, actually, you do not find Paul praying here for himself. Don't misunderstand me again. I'm confident that Paul prayed for himself. I know he prayed for himself. He tells us in Corinthians that he had a thorn in the flesh and that he went to the Lord about that and that he made that a matter of very definite prayer, by the way. He went to the Lord three times with it in order that God might get the thing through to him because it concerned him. Now, that was personal. But if you'll notice, the recorded prayers of the Apostle Paul are all intercessory prayers, praying for others. Have you ever stopped to think that that is an area today that you can engage in? There are many folks today that say, well, I'm not able to teach, I'm not able to preach, I'm not called as a missionary, 
I can't sing in the choir, and I can't do even personal work. My friend, you can pray. Actually, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are multiplied numbers of people that are shut-ins today that listen. I know they listen to our daily program. We've urged them from time to time to enter into a ministry of intercession. That is one of the greatest ministries that you and I can have today is a ministry of intercession, praying for others. Paul prayed for others. And then the third thing here is the brevity of his prayer. And I trust that the staff is listening as we deal with this particular point here, that prayer is brief. Actually, you can read both of these prayers in a minute. Paul was very brief. He went right to the point. And there's no recorded prayer in the Bible that is over three minutes. The prayer of Daniel is three minutes. I remember hearing the late Dr. Gabeline say, he says, I know how long it takes an angel to get from heaven to this earth. Three minutes. Because Daniel began to pray. And Dr. Gabeline says, when I read that prayer in the Hebrew, it takes me three minutes. And when he got to the end of the prayer, the angel says, when you began to pray, I was sent. It took him three minutes to get there. I don't think it took him that long. I think he was waiting for Daniel to finish. But Daniel took, if you please, three minutes in prayer. And then our Lord's Prayer, which is John 17. I've read it several times, once in the Greek, and it takes you three minutes to read that prayer. Prayers are brief, if you please. Our Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 7, When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. The fact that we make a long prayer, somehow or another, great many people think that that means that we're being heard or that we are extra pious, or that somehow or another that we are being very religious. A long prayer is no indication of the fact that you're being heard. You may be just repeating yourself and running nothing in the world but a Chinese prayer wheel, and you just well spin it because of the fact we're coming back and saying the same thing. Luther, Martin Luther said, fewer words, the better prayer. And we need to recognize the fact that we are taking God's time. Don't misunderstand. He's willing to listen. But if we're going to be very careful about composing a telegram that we send to some important individual, or if we're going to have an interview with some important individual, we turn over in our mind what we're going to say when we get there because we want to go right to the point Why don't we do that in our prayer life? Why don't we make prayer a real business? Why not study our own prayer life? And why not make our prayers effective by getting right down to the point? The little Scotch lady, when they had the visiting preacher, why, he was quite lengthy at the prayer meeting. And they were all kneeling around, and he stood up, and he was really wandering and sometimes preachers do. And she reached over finally and pulled him by the coattail, and she says, call him Father and ask him for something. My beloved, we need to call him Father and ask him for something. Prayers right to the point, if you please. And then there is a fourth characteristic of prayer that we notice here, and that is the posture of prayer. Will you notice in the third chapter, verse 14, for this cause, Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees. Now, that is something that I think that is needful today. I had hoped when we put these new pews in that we would be able to kneel here. But I've been down there and tried it out, friends. And though I've lost 30 pounds, I still find a problem of kneeling down between those pews. And I don't think it's practical or feasible for us to do that. But I wish we could return to the old-fashioned way they used to do in the country of kneeling a time of prayer. 
when I was a very young preacher, in fact, my first year in the ministry, I was invited in Middle Tennessee to hold a meeting. And when I got up at the first service, it began on a Sunday night. When I began, why, the little country church was packed out because they always do for those protracted meetings, as they call them. I said, let's pray. And I shut my eyes. And I heard a tremendous shuffling. And I didn't dare open my eyes because I was a young preacher then and I didn't want to be irreverent. I kept my eyes closed. And then I said, Amen, and opened them. And you know, I didn't see a soul. And I thought what had happened, they all walked out on me when we prayed. Then they began to come up between the pews. They came up just like the corn back there comes up. A few here, a few there, and in a minute they were all back in their pew again. They'd all been kneeling, if you please. And that was a hard wooden floor that had been scoured many times. But they believed in kneeling. And I do think it's a good position, and I hope you take that position when you pray privately. Get out on your knees. In fact, get out on your face before God. You see, man today is in rebellion against God. And if you ever notice the language that he uses for you and me today, and the way he speaks even of his people, he says, ye stiff neck. Stiffness. And there are two words for worship in the New Testament. One is to bow the head. The other is to bend the knee. You make either genuflection or you bow the knee or you bow or bend the head. We're stiff-necked. We want to look up in the face of deity. God says, get down before me. And we need to learn to bow before God. We need to recognize by the very fact that we bow that he's our sovereign, that we recognize him as our Lord, and that we are obedient unto him. My, how this generation needs to learn that you don't treat God as an equal. You do not even treat him as the superintendent. You do not treat him as a president. You treat him as the Lord of heaven, and we do well to go down on our faces. And Paul didn't seem to mind it. He says, I bow my knees. I bow my knees, if you please, before God. And we need to learn to get that body in the position that recognizes the rebellion is gone. We're no longer stiff-necked. We're no longer stiff-kneed. But we go down on our faces, before Almighty God. Now, those are the characteristics. There are others. I'll not mention them this morning. We want to be as brief as possible. The content of the prayers of Paul. Now, the content of the prayers of Paul are quite interesting also. We find, first of all, there is a note of thanksgiving running through all of his prayers. And I'm wondering if we have to wait till we get to November before we have Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving should characterize all of our prayers. Well, you notice the thing that he mentions here in the first chapter, verse 16. He says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And you will find again that he mentions this, and he says, He's doing this with thanksgiving. And you'll find when he wrote to the Philippians, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. Now that is a very strange expression for Paul to say that when you bring your request to God, you are also to come with thanksgiving. Now, there have been several ways of explaining that. There have been those that have said, well, now, what Paul really meant was this. He meant for you to thank God after you got your answer. You wait until you get your answer. Then you come back and thank him. The interesting thing is it's the same tense of the verb all the way through so that 
you can't give that interpretation. Paul says, at the very moment that you make your request, you thank him right there and then. And then there have been those that have tried to say, well, you always should thank him for past favors when you make requests for future favors. The only thing is, Paul didn't say that either. Paul says the request that you take to God, that's the request that you thank him for. And somebody says, well, wait a minute, he may not answer. Paul says he'll answer. I do believe one of the biggest misnomers today are the fact that many Christians say, I have unanswered prayers. Have you ever stopped to think what an insult that is to God today to say, I have unanswered prayer? What you're really saying is this. Well, you know, I took a request to God. He didn't hear me. He wouldn't listen to me. He wouldn't answer it. May I say to you this morning, if you're a child of God and you brought a request to God, he has heard and answered your prayer. He always does. You're to do it with thanksgiving. And somebody says, but wait a minute. I know practically I have unanswered prayers. My friend, again, may I resist you and say you do not have unanswered prayers. You got the answer. You didn't like it. And you call it an unanswered prayer. May I say to you, God says no. And no is the good answer. He says no many times. And frankly, I'm of the opinion that's his best answer. May I illustrate? My dad died when I was 14. That's when a boy thinks his dad's just about it. And I still think my dad is about it, and yet I know now he drank heavily. I know now he was far from God. I know now he'd not darken the church, but he's still a hero to me. I remember him just as that type of a man. And let me say this to you, I never took a request to him that he didn't answer. He always answered. But the best answer that he ever gave was no. I remember one time I asked him for a bicycle. He got me a second-hand bicycle. That wasn't too good. I went to him and asked him for a shotgun. He said no. And you know, that was about the best answer he ever gave. His no was more positive than his positive. When he said no, he meant no. No was no. Why don't you accept from God his no and say, I do not have unanswered prayers. I just don't seem to be praying in the will of God. Why don't you put the blame where it belongs? Not on God. You do not have unanswered prayers if you're God's child. He's just not answering them your way. He hears and answers prayer. Always does. Paul always felt that. And that's the reason that you find him. Paul says, I had a thorn in the flesh and I went to the Lord and I rationalized and I said, Lord, I got a thorn in the flesh. I'd be a better missionary if you take the thorn out. Paul said, nothing happened. And I went back the second time and I said, Now look, Lord, maybe you didn't quite understand what I was after the first time. What I really want is the thorn removed. And I'll be a better missionary. And he got no answer, according to Paul. But Paul went back the third time. And the Lord said to him, Paul, I heard you the first time. I've answered you. I'm not going to take it out. I'm just giving you grace to bear it. My friend, God hears. And answers prayer, always. Now, I do not know about you this morning, but I suspect there are those here and listening in today that can bear me out in this. I look back at my life. I go back to St. Louis. We came through there two years ago. And I said to my wife, you remember the trip we made here when, on our honeymoon? And we prayed a certain prayer. And did you know that God did not answer that prayer? Wait just a minute. He did answer. He slammed the door in our face. And from that day to the present, I have thanked God that he did that. 
I didn't know how to pray. I was praying wrong. And God says, no. And that was the most marvelous answer I've ever had to prayer. I thank him for it today. And I've been back to him and I said, Lord, thank you for hearing and answering the prayer the best way. Because I didn't know. Oh, my friend today, Paul always had a note of thanksgiving in his prayer. When he came to God, he says, here's the request. And he laid it out before him and he said, Lord, thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. And he always got the answer. And you, if you're God's child today, will get the answer. Now, there's another thing that identifies his prayers as to the content of them. Will you notice this? He prays to God the Father. And somebody says, well, you're being technical now, aren't you? Splitting hairs? Yes. But I want to be very frank with you. I think that it's very important to pray right. I went to ask about a ticket up in Portland. One of our men that used to be at Church Open Doors is now up there. And you talk about passing me around. I went up there to ask about the ticket, and they passed me from one man to another. And I said, I want to talk to the man that knows. Don't send me to somebody that is going to send me to somebody else. Send me to the man that can make the decision. And then I called for my friend and former member here, and, and he came down out of his office, and it was fixed in about three seconds. It's well here to know where to go. We are technical here. We split halves down here. What about our prayer life? I think we better be careful there also. Will you notice what Paul does? He prays. He prays to God the Father. Will you listen to him? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and so forth. And then over in chapter 3, listen to him. You may be able to comprehend no, that's not what I want. Verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I take it that Paul is being very scriptural because the Lord Jesus said to his apostles, you will recall, he says, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now the Lord Jesus Christ said, here's a new way of praying. You've never prayed this way before. Don't pray to me directly. Pray to God the Father in my name. You see, when you and I pray to the Son we lose the benefit of his intercession. He is our great intercessor. And when we pray to God the Father, he's at God's right hand, and he's ever lives to make intercession for us. He said, that's my child down there that's praying. Father, I want you to hear and answer his prayer this way, or that way, or another way. We lose the benefit of our intercession when we attempt to go directly to the Lord Jesus. Now, you say that's a technicality, sure. Somebody says, do you think he'd hear if you pray that? Sure he'll hear. But when I pray, I want the advantage of everybody, and I want to go to headquarters. And I want the benefit of everything that God has to offer. And my friend, don't we want to be scriptural? He says, Hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Now ask in my name, and ask the Father in my name. Well, I'm not splitting hairs. I'm just saying what's here in the Scripture, if you please. That is the thing that he mentions here, you see, and the thing that he emphasizes. 
Now, I don't want to labor that point, but let me move on. There's another matter of the content. He requests spiritual understanding. And I'd have you note that I think Paul prayed for material things. He asked for his eyes, if that was what the thorn in the flesh was, and I think it was. He prayed about physical infirmities. He prayed for the sick. He prayed that they might have a good journey. He prayed for material things. But the interesting thing here is he's not praying for physical advantages. He's not praying for material possessions. And we are surfeited today with secularism in our contemporary society, and we measure, unfortunately today, spiritual enterprises are measured by that which is material. And that's unfortunate because I believe right now some of the finest works of God are suffering financially. In fact, I'm confident of that. And it's not an evidence. This business today of saying, well, we know God's blessing because he's sending the money. I can name a whole lot of religious rackets that are getting the money, my beloved. That's not the measure of success. Not before God. The spiritual understanding is what he prayed for, and I'd have you note that. He says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then you will find that he also prayed back in this first prayer. Let me read this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now he's praying here for that which is spiritual, and he prays that they might have an illumination, an understanding, and to know the love of Christ. Now how many times do we pray for that? That is something today, and frankly, if I can mention a request, that's what I'd like to ask. Oh, you say, don't you want to pray for health? Yes. Don't you want to pray that all obligations be met? Yes. But after you've done that, what about a spiritual understanding? Paul says it passes knowledge. It means that your IQ won't help you here. This is something that only the Spirit of God can give you. For the eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. Don't stop there. But the Spirit, the Spirit is the one that leads us and guides us into all truth. And we need today to have a fresh anointing of the Spirit of God to understand divine truth. That's needed today. I am amazed at the error that is creeping into the church today. In fact, I'm overwhelmed by it. I had to go to Oregon to find out that even in Altadena, where I live, a new thing is broken out. You see, when they break out down here, they keep quiet, and I don't know why, but they always run out to the ends of the earth from here to begin. And then we begin to hear about them. Right up in my neighborhood, if you please. Something new breaks out. Why? Because today we need to be praying for that which passeth knowledge. We need to be praying for a spiritual understanding of the Word of God today, my beloved. And never have we needed that as we need it in this hour. And when I see today man after man going off on a tangent, 
men that I never dreamed would veer from the truth or today veering from the truth, I say to you today, we need to pray for each other that the eyes of our understanding be opened and that we understand divine truth. Now, I know I'm way out when I say that because some people say, well, boy, I've been praying for a new automobile and new models coming out and I need a new car and I've been praying about that. Isn't that all right? Sure. But when you pray for that, also ask for a little knowledge about how to drive it as well as a little spiritual knowledge also. A spiritual knowledge to understand divine truth. Now, that's not all. He requests spiritual power. And spiritual power is not measured by horses or kilowatts or what's under the hood of a car. Will you listen to him now again? And I'm through now. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us would who believe according to the working of his mighty power? He says now, I'm praying that you not only have an understanding, but that you have a power, a dynamic in your life. And what is that power? Well, the norm back in the Old Testament was this, Jehovah which brought you out of Egypt. That was always the norm of power. God would say to Israel, I will do this for you. And I am Jehovah who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That was power. He did it by miracle working power. That was the norm, but that's not the norm today for believers at all. The norm today is this, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Resurrection power. And Paul could say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. What do we know today? What do you know? What do I know today about resurrection power? Of having that power which wrought in Jesus, which brought him up from the dead, and put him at God's right hand. Will you listen to me? You and I will never get rid of this old nature. But this old nature needs to be put in the place of death in order that we might live by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the new nature. Do we know anything about that power today? Have you felt that power surging through you? I rode with a man up in Eugene, Oregon. He was kind enough to take me out to his country club to play golf, and apparently a very wealthy man out of Lincoln. He said, you know, McGee, I have to watch this speedometer all the time, the tremendous power of this car. He said, the other day I was driving up Portland, I was a hundred miles an hour before I knew it. But he said the cop knew it. He says, you just put your foot down on it and it's, oh, he says, what power? I said, you know, I said this to him, I said, you know, I wish that kind of power was in my life so I could start out today when you like to start out today living by that kind of power. Oh, not under a hood that power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's not all of it. Will you notice he mentions something else which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And right now we're finding out about ascension power. Right now our government is spending 20 billions of dollars and I personally think that's going to be chicken feed before it's over in order to get a man on the moon. And when he gets to the moon, he hadn't been anywhere. It's just like you walking out of your front door and picking up your paper in the yard compared to space. Twenty millions of dollars and the brains of the world are working on that today. Power. I'll tell you it's power. Paul says, I pray that that power that brought Jesus back from the dead and then took him off this earth in a glorified body back under to God's right hand might work in you. We need to pray for that, do we not? And honestly, 
today? Do we know much about that kind of power? Is our praying today really laying hold of God? I tell this corny story, if you don't mind. First time I went back to John Brown University, they took me around to show me everything, and they said, we want you to see the flying field. And I call, call them airports today, and that's not any better, by the way, who are airports. There's just much air anywhere else is at the port. But they called it a flying field, and I came up with this corny one. I said, well, I've been wanting to see a field fly. That's very corny, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't laugh at it either. But I went out, and I found out this. You don't do any flying on the flying field. That's where you take off. The flying is done up yonder. You know, sort of a joke, isn't it? We say we have a prayer meeting. <laughs> prayer meeting. Suppose you go out to the airport or go out to the flying field to fly. You get in the plane, you race the motor, you run down the runway, and then you come back and put it in the hangar. I've been out flying on the flying field. I've been out to the airport. We made it to the end of the runway, but we never took off. How many times do we really take off in prayer? How many times do we really pray? How many times do we really lay hold of God? God says, your prayer meetings are like flying fields. You ought to take off, but many of you never take off. You just race your motor. And you go back to the hangar. And you wonder why there's no vitality. You wonder why there's no strength. There's no interest in prayer today. May God teach us to pray. I'm of the opinion that the church today needs to be taught to pray just like those disciples did when they came to our Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray. God wants to hear the prayer of his own. Now I'm through. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But notice this next. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Did you know that God has never promised to hear the prayer of an unsaved man? And it's sentimental nonsense that some old reprobate can live any kind of life, his child gets sick, and he can go in and pray and ask God to heal the little one. God says he doesn't. He's under no obligation whatsoever. He says, my ears, my eyes are closed. I hear the prayers of my own, but not those that do evil. My face is against them. When they come to pray, I turn away from them. Well, somebody says, but can an unsaved person pray? Yes. One prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Which really means, oh God. I come to your mercy seat. Save me. You'll hear and answer that prayer of any unsaved person. And friends, until you come and accept this salvation, God says he's under no obligation to you whatsoever. But the minute you come, and we'll just say, you don't even have to ask him to provide a mercy seat. He's got one for you already. That's what Christ did, and he shed his blood in order that there might be a mercy seat. You don't have to ask him to be merciful. God is merciful. You just have to ask him to save you, and he'll save you. He's never yet.
turned down any, and the chief of sinners has already come and been saved. Shall we pray? As our heads are bowed this morning in prayer, briefly in this closing moment, I'm wondering if you've slipped into this place today, maybe several of you, and you've never really come to God in prayer to accept Christ. You've never really accepted his offer of mercy and grace that he offers to you in this wonderful Savior. He wants you to come for that. He says he won't hear and answer your prayer about other things. He's not even interested in it. His face is against those that do evil, but if you'll come and accept his mercy and his grace, he'll receive you and he'll save you.